Reg. Reg, turn your other hearer right on. <laughs> He's wound up in this book. That's what I said. You're trying to get somebody to cook those recipes for you. Welcome. Welcome to those that are joining us online. We're trying to get all settled down in here. Uh, but we're glad to have you. Uh, we're missing one of our regulars today. Uh, Pat Shoemaker. Pat had something last night and uh, was taken to the ER. Um, when I was over there this morning, the doctor said definitely low sodium uh, and the low blood pressure, which is not normal for her. Uh, she was doing a lot better today uh, already, but uh, they're going to be running a couple more tests and trying to get the sodium built up. So uh, I asked her, is it all right to lift that up? And she said yes uh, when I was over there this morning. She's at Keller, uh, 360, 356, <laughs> but I figured you have an easy way to find them, but uh, yeah, and she will be there today, it looks, sounds like, uh, as they run a few tests, so remember her, and uh, of course, uh, also remember uh, the Maples family, as Harold uh, passed away, and his service will be in here uh, tomorrow with visitation from 11 to 1 in the service at 1 o'clock. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your presence. We uh, are keenly aware that some events in life make us even more so of uh, the uncertainty of the journey of life. We thank you, God, for your grace that walks with us through it all. And through it all, as the song says, we come to learn to trust you more. We thank you for your word and the power of your word that brings such relevance into our lives and such instruction and power. Open us to what you want to teach us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Last week I shared that I had been given uh, a new commentary on the book of Romans uh, by a Messianic Jewish scholar, Arnold G. Frenchingbaum, Frenchtenbaum, something like that. Uh, I listened to the pronouncer, but when you can't understand the pronouncer, it doesn't help you very well. Uh, I bring that attention because uh, I, I thought it was significant. It's just a God timing that here is a Messianic uh, Jewish scholar and we're getting into the section of Romans that Paul's dealing with the Jews. So he can bring some interesting insights as we uh, get into chapter 9, 10, and 11. Uh, and uh, in the first chapter, Paul declared in uh, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's saving power for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Gentiles. Well, in chapter 9, it's kind of like Paul's back to the Jews first. Uh he begins to focus on that Jewish community of which he was one. And uh, Arnold outlines this chapter this way. In Romans 9, 1 through 5, Paul owns love for and sorrow for Israel. And we will hear his pain as he thinks about them. In verses 6 through 13, we look at Israel's rejection of the Messiah, but it's not a failure of God's promise, as some wanted to say. And then in Romans 
14 through 29, the rejection is also due, not due to any injustice on God's part. So he's trying to say that because what they see as the Jewish failure to be followers of the Messiah, it's not because God didn't do his part. That's what the journey is about. And then in verses 20 through uh, 21 of chapter 10, the problem is simply that Israel rejected the righteousness of God. Now, we're not going to get through all that today. Uh, there's no way. We could stay all day and not get past verse 5 if we wanted to. Uh, I got to look at accounting after going, I said, Man, how many pages is he going to deal with the first 15 verses? He, he dealt with the first 15 verses in 12 pages. Now, if you're used to reading commentaries like that, they normally get con more concise that you'll take a section and have maybe a page or two. Not 12 pages uh, for, for, for 15 verses. Uh, don't worry. We're not going to go in that depth today. Uh, if you want to go in that depth, you can borrow my book when I get through. <laughs> so let's get started. Picking up with uh, verse 1. Let's just go through the first five verses. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accused and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belongs the patriarchs. And from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Wow. Here, Paul has spent the last few chapters dealing with the good news of Jesus. That righteousness comes through his saving grace. But now he's very much aware that in his own family of faith, the Jewish community, many of them have not received Christ. The one that they have been looking for, the one that they had been taught is coming, they didn't receive. In fact, they rejected him. The leadership of the Jewish community, the Sanhedrin particularly, led that rejection. And did you hear the brokenness in his heart? Let me read that again. Only this time we'll read from the New Living Translation. I am telling the truth because I belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit tells my heart that I'm not lying. I have much sorrow. The pain in my heart never leaves. I could even wish that I might be kept from being with Christ if that would help my people to be saved from the punishment of sin. They are of my own flesh and blood. They are Jews and are the people God chose for himself. He shared his shining greatness with them and gave them his law and a way to worship. They had his promises. The early preachers came from this family. Christ himself was born of flesh from this family, and he is over all things. May God be honored and thanked forever. Let it be so. I think J.D. Watts captured Paul's expression when he says that Paul now faces his worst nightmare. 
his own people are rejecting the gospel. And he's broken. He's hurt. Uh, and so he writes, the Holy Spirit tells my heart that I am not lying. Since he's not lying, he's telling the truth about the reality of where the Jewish community are at that time. That the ones that God had chosen were now not living up to that chosenness and had rejected the Messiah. His heart is broken. In despair. He shares several different ways of looking at that. Uh, but uh, it was like he was saying, you know I belong to Christ, and you know I'm not going to lie because the Spirit's got him. And to me, that, that was one truth that uh, I gleaned for that because uh, sometimes I hear some say, well, I'm telling you the truth. Well, if somebody's preaching the gospel, I don't have to tell me I'm telling the truth because I would expect it to be the truth. And if you find it not to be the truth, then you begin to question everything the person says. Paul saying, you can count on it because it's coming from the Holy Spirit. It's the truth. Now, the Hebrew people, God called and raised up. Not because they were special. Their specialness came from God's call. There was nothing that set them apart except that God called. The uniqueness. But they took that and made themselves or acted as if they were special. They never really fully understood it. And sometimes I wonder if the church isn't like that. That we are the redeemed. We are his people now. A chosen priesthood, Peter writes. And we kind of begin to feel like we're special. And in one sense we are. But not any more special than God's love for everybody else. Sometimes we have the problem of the Hebrews. Uh, he goes on, theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, all this that we know the story of. The temple worship and the promises that are the covenants. Theirs are the patriarchs. And notice, from them the, is the Trace the human ancestry of Messiah who is God over all forever. It all comes down to Messiah. And in fact, he said that the ones who were the first preachers of this good news were that ancestry. And that's true, right? All 12 of the, tw the first disciples were Jews themselves. Now, we begin to get some Greek influence in the New Testament writings and some that begin to share Jesus, but not of the original first ones preaching the gospel. But not all of them got it. Unfortunately, the people called Israel, largely due to their leaders, <coughs> were actively rejecting Jesus of Nazareth as being the Messiah of God. <coughs> what I hear here is Paul is broken hearted for them. It's breaking it. It's pain. <coughs> and I'm hit. Excuse me. <coughs> I hadn't coughed all morning. And I get too wound up talking. <coughs> I'm really hit by. Uh -huh. Uh 
grave. Yeah. Anguish is much deeper than just grief. Yeah. 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 He, good point uh, that he's thinking that this could change Christian history because a good number of the ones of the Hebrew descendants were not accepting him. That definitely was not God's plan. Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious when he when they nail him to the cross. That's a pretty big rejection, isn't it? Yeah, uh, his heart's broken over that. His family, uh, the entire purpose of Israel, the people of God, was what to declare and demonstrate the works of God to the world. You, you read the covenants with Abraham. It was always to be a blessing to the world. Not a separatist movement. But they seem to forgot that. And sometimes that happens today. As ones who kind of get tied up with God in some way. And then gets fixated that they have been blessed. Not to be a blessing. But blessed. For themselves. Uh, and we've seen those kind of movements. <coughs> there was a time when the charismatic movement kind of moved that way in some sects. Charismatic movement, I think, did, was a great gift to the church until some kind of put themselves on a pedestal. And uh, I know in one of my early churches, there was uh, one who, if you listen to her, she thought she was better than all the other members because she had gifts they didn't have. That was never the intent of the Spirit of God. We don't all have the same gifts. And, and it still creeps in at times. Uh, Paul is concerned about <coughs> his family, the Jews, not coming to faith. So in these three chapters, he really deals with the Jewish family and the rejection. And it's breaking his heart. The Life Application Bible made this point. Paul showed a rare depth of love. Like Jesus, he was willing to sacrifice his life for others. Like Jesus, that's what he says. Now, I know that even today there are those who go into certain parts of our world that are willing to put their life on the line for Jesus. Was it the movie, something to spear, about missionaries who were killed? But that opened the door. Uh, and, you know, we're aware of the uh, visual of Christians being beheaded over in the Middle East just a few years ago because of the uh, terrorist groups there. People are willing to take a stand and still they're, they go in there. Uh, we don't all sacrifice in that same way. But that the depth of love. So the lap application tried to, the whole purpose of most of its notes, and if you've never read in the Life Application Bible, it's one of now one of my favorite study Bibles. 
uh, it raised the question, how concerned are you for those who don't know Christ? It's how concerned. Are you willing to sacrifice your time, your money, your energy, comfort, and safety to see them come to faith in Jesus? Now think about the revival that's taking place over in the jail, county jail. I mean, uh, I, I use the revival because what else do you explain people coming to faith practically every week? But there's a sacrifice made. There's a group of men who give themselves Tuesday after Tuesday after Tuesday to go in. Can't say that it's dangerous. But I can say it's not the most comfortable setting. And... Uh, They're not really threatened, but they do hear some language at times that they prefer not to hear. But the amazing work of God, because somebody takes makes a sacrifice of time. And as I look at it, most everywhere people are coming to faith, somebody is making a sacrifice of time to go. To be there. Even in the church with movements like uh, the weekend for discipleship with our youth. There were sacrifices of time that all those adults could have been doing something else, but they were giving of themselves. Uh, as I tried to illustrate the other day, you know the love that people talk about on the mass walk. It takes place because somebody sacrificed. And people don't realize how much time uh, they will give. Uh, it's about 25 hours of preparation. Maybe it's 30 hours. Over four Saturdays getting ready, or most of them are on Saturdays, for going down there. And then they pay their own way to be there, and many of them aren't even in the main room. They're just doing stuff in the background. That's a service of love. And then uh, we'll be commissioning a couple from our church that are heading to serve with... Uh, our mission partners, uh, Sir, uh, great day, R Sarita Carson. They're leaving next week. They're giving of their time, paying their own way. That sacrifice. <coughs> we all don't do it the same way. Now I understand that the, this man sitting here on the front was up in New York just the other weekend, passing out Bibles, sharing the gospel. You know, but you don't have to go out. There's people around here that need Jesus. It doesn't take much looking. Do we have that deep concern for people's lives? In verses 4 and 5, Paul lists some of the privileges that the Israelites had. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the ancestry of the Messiah. So Paul describes God choosing Israel as an adoption. An adoption. Did you hear that? It was the work of God's grace that chose them. Not something they earned. We often think of grace coming with Jesus. 
But God's always been a God of grace. He wasn't moved to choose Abraham because of what Abraham had done. It was his grace that chose Abraham. That's God's actions. He chose. And that it's interesting, it came to me that this is the same image Paul uses to describe Christians in Ephesians. When he says, We have been adopted as God's children. And that's adoption, not something we initiated, it's something he initiated. And that most of the time the case, isn't it? Adoptions are something the adopting parents initiate. You know, we have some that have gone to other parts of the world to adopt the children that they now have in their home. <coughs> that wasn't the children seeking them, it was parents seeking the children. That's the image here. Uh, you could say that since the fall of Adam and Eve, no one has been worthy. But God loves and seeks relationship. Well, let's pick up with verse 6. It is not as though the word of God had failed. And what I read in couple of commentaries including this one here is that it seems as if the the Greek community was trying to say that the word had failed because the Hebrews were not receiving Christ and so it's not Paul said it's not the word of God that failed for not all Israel Israelites, excuse me, truly belong to Israel. Ooh. And not all Abraham's children are his true descendants. But it is through Isaac that the descendants shall be named for you. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Now is it that all, nor is it that all, something similar happened to Rebekah when she had conceived children by one husband, our ancestor Isaac, even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad so that God's purpose of election might continue, not by works, but by his call, she was told the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. What then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Well, now there's a whole lot that can be unpacked there. Uh, first of all, here Paul takes his readers through a little Hebrew history. Starting with Abraham. The call. And making the point that God is the one who decided to choose Abraham, not the other way around. And more than one son <coughs> was born to Abraham. We know the story. Ishmael and then Isaac. But only one son was the son of the promise. Isaac. That's his point. God chose. In fact, Sarah understood that there would be a child. He quotes there. And God decided that Isaac 
would give birth through his wife, of course, his wife, Sarah, with his wife, not Sarah, with his wife, Rebecca. And what is it? There are two. But what did he say? God chose Jacob, not Esau. God chose. And he was not the firstborn, and you know the story about how that happened. Jacob got labeled a swindler, and he really was, in swindling his brother out of the birthright. Here's Briscoe's point. The children of Abraham had branched in many directions, but God had firmly committed himself to pursuing his purpose down the channel of Isaac, Jacob, Judah, through David, until Christ was born. God chose. God's in the choosing business. And the result was two kinds of Abraham children. You hear it in the scripture. There are those who were children by flesh, and there were the children of the promise. As Paul begins this section, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Kind of interesting statement, isn't it? Not all Israel who are of Israel. And then he writes in verse 8, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. You see, when you really look at it, there are other children there. But God chose his line to keep his promise going. Now, Arno in his book comes at it a little differently, but not contradicting it. He said the Paul, that Paul used the biblical history to show that Jews are not heirs of the blessing just because they are the seed, the natural physical seed of Abraham. While certain blessings come because of that natural seed, there are other blessings of God that are conditional on other matters. Spiritual blessings that deal with the issue of salvation are not conditionally purely upon the natural seed, but physical descent did put one with the scope of the Abrahamic the Abrahamic covenant, but that is not enough for salvation. Just because they were the natural seed, the physical descendants wasn't enough to bring salvation. It led to God choosing a line through which he will bring the Messiah who would be the savior of the world. Now, J.D. Watts began this teaching on this section saying, the Bible is at the same time both super accessible and very complex. And you get the feeling we're in that second part. We probably need some visual aid on this one. Uh, and it would help if I could get this thing out of my mouth while I quit coughing. But he says, sometimes the plain reading is the right reading. But at other times, the plain reading can obscure the better reading. And... Uh, he suggests that chapter 9 through 11 is one of those places where the plain reading gets confusing. There's something much deeper. You see, over the centuries, the 
simple plain reading of this section is what led to the Calvinist form of predestination or to what some call the doctrine of election. Ben Willington in one of his teachings on this explains that Paul's aim is to refute certain accusations that the Gentiles had about the Roman community. Namely, Roman Christians assumed that God had favored the Romans or Gentiles rather than the Jews. The argument as a whole in Romans 9 to 11 then is about corporate election, not individual election. Corporate election. Not something we hear much about. So, what about the issue of predestination and salvation? And how do they relate to election? Ben reminds us that these should not be mixed. They each have different meanings. First, you can be part of an elect group and not be saved. That's what Paul's saying. You can be part of the elect group of the Hebrews and not be saved. That's because election about God's calling is a spe for specific purpose takes place while you're on earth. For example, Cyrus. Would anybody call him saved? But God chose him at the right time to do a work for God's people. And then, uh, on the other hand, and you can read about that uh, in Isaiah 45, 1. Um, only two among God's elect that left Egypt made it into the promised land. He chose to try to redeem them all, but they didn't walk in faith. And we remember what happened. They were sentenced to 40 years of wandering there and only two were walked in. So Arnold devotes these 12 pages, as I've said, to these verses. And he comes down to four points Paul's making. So I thought that it, that'd be something to look at. Uh, since he's more expert of Jewish tradition than I am. And these are the four points. God's word has not failed, although Israel has failed. God's plan is still being worked out. He's still working his plan, his purpose. We saw that last week, no matter what happens for those who love him, he's going to bring good. That passage from Romans 8. We can walk in trust knowing that if we love God and are serving God, he's going to work things out. Now, we also reminded ourselves that doesn't mean it's going to work out physically necessarily as we hoped. Because I imagine if if we were honest, most all of us have parts of our physical makeup that we would have liked God to not let happen or at least heal us from it or take some of the pain from us. But he sees us through. And we talked about that. The second is the spiritual blessings come not through one's physical descendant nor personal merit. Spiritual blessings are not the result of our heritage, in other words. The makeup of our family and our own physical merits, the good things we've done. They come by 
the grace of God due solely to the will of God. He's the one that's still authority. And the final point was physical descendant alone will not obtain these promises, but rather physical descent and spiritual appropriation. It's got to come through the spirit. We all have that responsibility where we have to take ownership. So what suggests that in this passage, <coughs> We must read these verses in the lens of the whole Bible. You've heard it, haven't you? That you can take any verse of the Bible and prove something if you want to. And whatever you want to believe, you can find a verse to support it. Or it can be like that verse that's not a verse that uh, I made reference to Sunday as the one who always is saying to me, but you no, know, it's in the Bible uh, that God helps those who help themselves. How many good things have we associated with being in the Bible that on one hand, well, it sounds kind of good, but they're not scriptural. Uh, and uh, so we're good at coming up with that. So in th this chapter and the next couple chapters, Paul asks, no less than, listen to this, 20 questions. He quotes from the Old Testament 30 times. And the clincher comes with the key term that he repeats in some eight times in this section. And what's that key term? Mercy. That's where the section ended. Quoting from Micah, I mean Malachi, excuse me. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. And what we discover in Jesus is not based on our actions, it's not based on our doings, it's based on his love. Based on his love. He's the first mover. And as the first mover, we're to love him first and put him first. It's his desire for our lives. Well, if you wanted a discussion on Calvin, you came to the wrong place. We're not Calvinists. Uh, although it is amazing how many people retreat to Calvinism because it's an easy way to try to explain the difficult things of life. God did it. Uh, as I shared Sunday, uh, I'm convinced that God didn't cause me to land on my head when I got tackled at Troy and broke my neck. But he used that in my life. Uh, but I've heard people standing in a visitation line at a funeral home saying God did this. I mean, that, that really helps, doesn't it, when God wanted her with him. Well, God does want to spend eternity with every one of us, but I don't believe that God caused that accident so that he could get her on up there. That's uh, it, But it's easy to drift back into Calvinism. But that's not what really is this passage. And... Uh, I appreciated that's not where he went with it. And that's not where Briscoe went with it. Uh, but I, I'd have to read a different form of commentary to find some teachings on that, I guess. I'm sure you got bunches of questions, and I'm not sure that I have bunches of answers.
uh, except I know that God is faithful. And I did like the insight that this is corporate, what he's talking about, this predestined plan, corporate. He's not talking about individual selection. Well, we've mentioned a couple of prayers uh, to start with. I continue to lift up Pat and the test that she has today and lift up the Maples family. Uh, remember Don Fitz? He's, uh, I haven't checked on him today, but uh, he is feeling better, but uh, he was... Uh, told yesterday that he really needs to go back to rehab and uh, I guess it was convincing to him that the doctor was in there when the therapist had come to help him move and he realized his legs weren't cooperating and so uh, at least that helped it settle in that he does need to go to rehab uh, I'll remember him in that journey and Gloria because she was hoping for him to be back over Renaissance with them. <clears throat> what other prayer concerns do we have today? Jimmy Fry's in the hospital? Okay. But she, I knew that he was taken. Uh, do I, we knew that he was taking a Sunday to ER, but uh, Jake said he would tell me if he was going to stay, so I assumed that he had gotten out. I don't know whether this is... Okay, so maybe he ended up going back. Uh, and that's... I know he was taken to North Alabama, so I guess that's where it is. Joanne, if... You can make a note where he is with be checking on him. He's battled with several different health issues lately. Anyone else? Tomorrow. So Fred, uh, Freddie is dealing with uh, still the back pains and all. Remember him as he goes for another epidural tomorrow. Um, and, and remember uh, Eric Brown, who is uh, the pastor at the new church in Red Bay. He's uh, got neck issues and they... He's recovered from a surgery where they went in and did some work there. And then based on my understanding is they had to go down and clean out some bones through his elbow, shoulder and elbow to open up some of the pressure from, that just sounds horrible. Uh, I don't know what all, all it's involved, but uh, he's, he's, uh, limited somewhat. Remember Randy Davis who had surgery also on his shoulder. He's limited somewhat right now. Both of them cannot drive. They have to be driven. Uh, Randy hopes to get out of that next week. Also, uh, when you mentioned <clears throat> the tingling and all, and Betty Blue is not sitting over there today. She uh, had a procedure in Memphis that seemed to have worked <clears throat> because she's been having pain in the back and all, and, and uh, so they had a procedure, and uh, at, at least Monday evening that seemed to have worked. The, the pain seemed to be gone. 
So we give praise for that. I'm not certain if she's get back in town or not. Uh, but to remember her. And uh, Jim had another test done on Monday and waiting words on, and no, being sent to another one. So uh, do you have another one today? Oh, okay. They just want to test you up. Okay, so they must have kept him then. All right. Well, let us pray. Awesome God, how great you are. How loving you are. And God, sometimes in your word, uh, it is not the easiest to understand and trying to apply from the culture that it's written into our culture. But the message is very clear. You love your people, all of us. And you want a relationship with us. But we have to make a response. We have to receive it. You don't force yourself upon us. God, open us to your grace. And we pray, God, for your healing power to be manifested in these that have been mentioned. Give direction where there's some issues that need to be dealt with, that that will be revealed to the doctors and guide in those steps. We thank you for the medical world and we pray your blessings upon them in their day-to-day -day work to help people find healing and wholeness. And God, uh, we know that you still do the divine work. Sometimes through the medical world, sometimes through the medicine, sometimes through the divine touch, and we pray for your divine touch in these lives that have been mentioned. We pray for your comforting spirit to be manifested in those who are walking through dark valleys. We pray, God, that as we go out, we'll go out remembering that we are people of grace who are your people because of your adoption. Forgive us when we fail to have a heart for those that you're still wanting to adopt into your family and help us to truly Bear witness to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in his peace and grace. Thank you. Thank you.